Ladies and gentlemen, won't you please join me in welcoming the Atua, Mr. Hype Williams. Welcome, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, we're here in 42nd Street, Times Square, a um, place where back in the day a lot of people came to watch films on the weekends and whatnot. Um, I don't know if that was a part of your experience being a native New Yorker, um, but I'm curious to know where and when did you fall in love with the moving image? Mm, that's a tough one. Um, it's probably at a very young age, younger than most um, stuck in front of the television. It's kind of, you know, five, six years old, like plugged in. That's, that's pretty much what happened. And uh, films at that time were uh, mostly on, you know, uh, television. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't like it is now. I guess that's what I'm, I'm really struggling to think about. It wasn't a, it was like literally stuff that would get broadcast on network television, old movies. And uh, that's how I got turned on to it. Um, where did you grow up, for those who may not be aware of your, of your history? Um, well, I'm from New York, um, St. Albans, Queens, which is a little, little part of uh, the borough. And uh, literally, you know, Q-Tip's grandmother lived around the corner from my house. I went to Catholic school at Run DMC, stuff like that. So, like, that part, that little part of where I'm from... Uh, it's like a, a very special part of uh, New York, I think. What, um, what was the music that was impacting you as a child? I mean, obviously, the moving image is something that is the focus of your life, but music is also the focus of your life. When, uh, when, did you first be ca when were you first captivi captivated excuse me, by sounds that you might have heard around the house? Um, you know, I had a, a, one of those houses where my, my older brother lived in the attic and, uh, he just turned me on to everything. Like he would play like old Stevie Wonder and old Doobie Brothers and, you know, just like the weirdest mix of stuff. But at that time, uh, there was no hip hop. Mm -hmm. So all the music that, that I grew up on was, uh, soul music. It was like, uh, Stevie Wonder. I must have listen to uh, songs in the key of life, you know, my whole growing up. So it was like uh, visual music came from soul music. And I think that's a lot of us, like the, the people that, that I'm associated with that come from that era, um, we didn't have hip hop. So it came, it, it, it came into existence while we were growing up. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. So that's what happened. It, it's uh, it's just like this weird thing that growing up in New York, the different boroughs, everybody had a different perspective, different type of person who introduced them, like a different uncle who lived in the attic or brother who was in a band or something like that. So when you were listening to music as a child, were you visualizing the music even at an early age or was that something that came a little bit later on? Um, I'm going to say it was always there because, uh, music is colorful and that era of music, especially it's like, it's all analog. There was no computers, things like that. You know, uh, it just seemed that way. Like, you know, you heard it that way. And, uh, remember like Stevie Wonder was, was, was blind. So... 
the fact that he was able to to be the, the level of artist that he he is without the use of his eyes is crazy. You know what I mean? And, and there was no there's no electronics to help him. He he, he was playing those instruments. So that kind of I think that the, those things affected affected me, affected all of us. You know, it wasn't a. I have these conversations, by the way, with um, my peers, like these guys that I grew up with, like Puff and you know Jay. Those guys. When we talk about music, this is the stuff that we talk about. It's just it's just where uh, we came from. Now, and you mentioned you know knowing music before hip hop. What was the gateway then, the the entry point for you? as far as is hip hop and becoming a part of your life? Um, well, it had to be, uh, I think it was through the original stuff, like the original stuff that came out of New York was Funky Four, I know that probably sounds real crazy to you guys, but that was the name of the group. Uh, those guys had records. Um, Melly Mel and those guys have records. So the stuff that we were hearing, the first rap was the, the, literally the first rap. <laughs> so that, that's it just, just how far back I go. You're taking me way too far. I didn't mean to talk about any of this, but <laughs> I was going to come out here and, and try to go forward, and he's taking us backward. Well, we, I, just trying to get a little sense of uh, your foundation because it, it, you know, it profoundly influences everything that comes after it. Um, well, I guess I'm curious to know then as far as just getting into the professional realm of doing this, what was the turning point for you? Mm, uh, you have to uh, restate that one. Well, you went to school to study film, right, at Adelphi. Um, when did you get your break in the business? Okay, um... It was a very small production company here in New York. And they had a little broadcast network. It was on the, what's called a UHF channel. I don't know if you guys know anything about that. But that was the first kind of glimpse of a broadcasting of music videos that, based, that were based on rap. And I, I just couldn't get enough of it. Like It was like one of those things that all of us just... We were tuned into it, and it was uh, Video Music Box. That was the name of it. Uh, um, and uh, I was one of the kids. Like, you know, they brought me in young, and uh, I don't know. Somebody just just saw that I, I, I had some kind of talent, and they, they let me just, you know, be creative in that environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was... Uh, I'm sorry, can you restate the question one more time? No, just, just how you got into the actually production and... and right. So I, I was the driver, the gopher, if you guys know what a gopher is. So I was the gopher for like Big Daddy Kane and Cool G Rap videos, um, Public Enemy videos. I used to drive Chuck D around. Like this is old school stuff, man. But this is, I guess, where it all comes from. I think... What I would like to express by telling you this is that uh, I'm from the beginning of the whole thing. So this is this is real. So I, you know, I sweep floors and and so did others. Like you know, when I was an intern, Puff was also an intern. So we have that in common. And I saw him kind of like do it differently. But I think those beginnings is, is is I think that's the right answer for you. Like that's that's really like how we got influenced by the the pioneers. Like, I, I remember, you know, Russell was around, you know, when he was just getting started with Def Jam. He was like an icon to us. That kind of thing. Yeah. And um, when did you, when did you sort of say to yourself, this, this field, this genre of, um, of filmmaking is what I want to do. Um, w you know, working on music videos, you know, working in production, like you said, um, as a go for a production assistant, whatever it might be, you know, it's grueling work. Um, you're the first person on the set and the last person to leave. Um, but, 
you know, what was it about that experience that really motivated you to, to make it what you wanted to do? Um, well, it was by accident. Like, I have to say, I, I never wanted to do music. That wasn't my thinking. You know, I wanted to get my hands on a camera to, because I, I had ideas and I wanted to be a filmmaker. And the first opportunity I had was to work with Ralph and those guys, and I saw music videos and how production was done differently from what, the way I was taught in school. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do this to get my hands on the stuff that, that I want to learn. And, you know, I ran around and talked to all the camera people and all the, the crew people who worked in videos and annoyed everybody. Everybody hated me because I, I just wanted questions answered. But it was never to do music. It was more to, uh, to get a hold of, of the, the tools. But what I found out was the stuff that was being done at the time was so shitty, it, it just felt like I should be doing, I could do it much better because they didn't love it. They didn't love the people who were doing it at the time. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just letting you know from a young person's point of view, it just looked bad all the time. It was, there was rappers in junkyards and shit like that. Like it wasn't, you know, rap, the early rap videos were, were not good. So I thought, well, maybe someone should, should apply themselves differently. And I tried, I tried to talk to these people because I was into film to apply these things, that these uh, photography-based things, lighting. And no one would listen. So I just said, I'll just do it myself. And was there a particular inspiration in terms of just filmmakers, um, films, um, things that you saw that were, you know, of the quality that you felt you could bring to, to hip-hop music videos at that time? Um, it was a myriad of stuff like that, but it was a, there was a woman a long time ago uh, who worked at a record label when I was... Young kid, I was a gopher, just dropping stuff off at the office, and she would listen to my stories about how I wanted to be this great uh, director. And uh, she, she likened what I told her to three filmmakers. She said, to me, you're, the, you're a combination of these three guys, and I want you to go study these three guys. And one was John Paul Goode, one was uh, um, John Baptiste Mondino, and I think it was uh, Michelle Gondry. That was the three. And she said, if you, you look at these three, I'm telling you, this is how I see you as a combination of this for your culture. This is an Italian lady, young Italian lady, but she just, she just gave me so much confidence. And uh, I, I still look at those, those three as uh, groundbreaking for their era. You know, if you know, if you guys know those names, they're, Pretty impressive names, and as a kid, I didn't know anything about them, but I learned, so. I mean, one of the things I always, um, I always think about in terms of your work um, is that it's elevated the songs themselves to different places. Um, it's not about a, it's not always about a, a literal translation or, or, or treatment of a song. It's just something where the imagination goes elsewhere. Um, was, there a, was, there a, was there something that in particular, was it those filmmakers and photographers? Was it somebody else that sort of like inspired you in that way? Because you could, you know, these are the great storytellers and lyricists. You could take their stories and, and you know, deliver them on the screen, you know, line by line, or you can do something even more creative, which is what you were doing. I just think I was uh, like any other kid in the hood. I was a sponge. You know, they, they, she gassed me up into thinking like, you know, you're, a, you know, you're this great, you know, you, your art and music and fashion together as a young person. So she had me really thinking like, well, I'll just take everything that I can and use it. And, and luckily for me, I wasn't alone. Like I had friends who are all really, um, to, in my mind, masters at what they do. Like, you know, I had, you know, my first cinematographer was Malik Saeed, who, uh, he's, a, he's a master, but we started together. So yeah. it's that kind of thing. Like I just happened to have a great 
group. Yeah. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't take credit by myself. Who are some of the other people that uh, were so important and have been so important to you? It's endless. It's like, you know, June Ambrose is another person who was like, you know, you know we started together. Um, it's endless. Like, I, 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 the names is, is just crazy. It's too many people. But luckily, we all started together and we all started here. And, you know, we built off of each other. Was there a moment that was a turning point for you as far as just, you know, I mean, obviously, what you mentioned as far as the videos at a certain era were not presented the way you wanted to see them. But this is also a double standard as far as the industry and what's available in terms of resources. You know, what were you able to do to sort of stretch resources to make something look better than what you had available to you, perhaps like budget-wise or something like that? Um, I think the right answer for that it was change. Like, I, I came about at a time of change. So all of that stuff that was happening was detrimental to the change that was about to come. It was old. No one saw hip-hop as valuable but us. So that era changed it all, and we, we were the tool for that. So it was just being a part of that change, knowing who everyone was. You know, Puff knew who I was. So it, when he got his first record deal, he had no problem saying this kid is going to shoot everything. It's probably very similar to what's happening now, but it just so happened then that we, we changed the, the culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. I hope I'm answering these questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, why don't we take a look at something um, from your repertoire? Uh, no, anything but that. <laughs> uh, okay. Can we please? It would, it would really, I think we're sitting here in this theater and it's just a great opportunity to see something special. So why don't we take a look at Tupac and Dr. Dre with Roger Troutman and the video, of course, is California Love right up here. Now you say you never watch these, ever. Well, thank you for being so kind. And uh, when I see this, it just reminds me of the good old days when Dre would, you know, sit and do a, a edit with me. You know what I mean? Like, that, that was the level of artist he was. Like, we did it together. All, all of us, all of these things, I just want to be clear. It was a collaboration. We all put our, our everything into it. Pac, Dre, you know, every artist. So like that, that era, that's what everyone was doing. So I, I would love to be able to take all the credit, but, you know, it was like a family thing. So thank you again for that. Now, what were the, what was the, I mean, obviously Mad Max is the visual inspiration for this, but, you know, where does this come from as far as just like, the song is California Love. If you're going to follow the lyrics, literally, you know, you'd be going through, you know, Compton, Watts, wherever, following the lyrics. But this is obviously taking it someplace far different. Jada Pinkett. Um, Jada was the one who wrote this treatment with Dre. And uh, they just called me and they were like, listen, there's no one that we, we can have do this but you. And, you know, people probably don't realize that Jada was a, a filmmaker, like, first. You know, so she, she really has a lot of, of things under her belt that people probably should investigate. But this is one of them. Like, she really felt like she wanted to take the song and, 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 and bring it to life in a different way. And lucky for me, she said, like, listen, at the time, you're the... You're the only one who could do this. I mean, did...
I mean, how, how sort of deep does the Mad Max thing go? I mean, if we, if we think back to the circumstances around this record, it's a, a very highly anticipated record. You know, Pac had just gotten, you know, come home. Um, he had newly signed to Death Row. Um, he has this collaboration with Dr. Dre, so it's like two of the biggest stars in music at the time. Um, you know, Mad Max films, I guess, are about... Um, they're about survival. They're about retribution um, to some degree. Was there, you know, am I overthinking this? Was there anything, like, involved in this on any other level? I, I think you just got to go back to the time. Like, this is, like, Death Row at the height of Death Row. And Dre just was, like, in a place where he, he wanted to make movies. Mm -hmm. This is my movie. So, like, you know, remember the, the one before this was Natural Born Killers, which was Dre and Ice Cube and directed by F. Gary Gray. As a video, so like he wanted to do big things, and this is just him saying, "Yo, I got a ton of money, and I want to go crazy." Yeah. <laughs> was this was this one of the the bigger budget things that you had at that time to that point, um, or were there were you know I'm just wondering like within the sort of trajectory of the business at the time, if this was a peak at that at that moment. No, this is '96. '96. It yeah. peaked in '97. So yeah. everything was kind of going in a direction. And like everything else, we all just took it too far. Everybody had too much <laughs> access to everything. And uh, that's what happened. So basically, the, 90, the, the, the end of the 90s was that. It was right. just like, you know, this crazy celebration of everything going right. But, I mean, it's a, it's a genuine celebration. I mean, I think that the thing, I mean, obviously, this is not the example that, you know, people would cite in terms of, some of the stuff that you've done, um, like they will point to, well, another video, I guess, that we'll look at in a little bit. But um, this celebration is also a celebration of, like you said, things going right. Things going right for young entrepreneurs in the business, you know, who grew up in the culture like yourself. Um, and I, I feel like this is a, I mean, you can speak to this better than I can, but it's, I feel like this is a point that sort of gets lost. You know, people can look at the superficial aspects of, of these, these images on screen. But I feel like there is something genuinely celebratory about it. I mean, do you feel that way? Well, I feel at that time, the music industry was being run by brains. And let me explain why I say that. There was a lot of very powerful, very important, very smart people in the music business at the head of it at every label. And those people understood what was happening and, and how to step back and, and support and allow it. So that's why I say brains, because it, it seems with the changes that's happened in the music business that a lot of the people who would be making those kinds of decisions now aren't supporting the, the craft. I'll use that word, craft. So anyway, so going back to the 90s, that was a celebration, the fact that we had all the authority. There was no one um, limiting anybody. So, you know, Dre was at his height. Puff was at his height. You know, Death Row, all these labels were like, um, able to be successful in ways that they'll never that, that haven't happened again because there was no um, no restraints. But as a filmmaker, <clears throat> you're on this production. It's chaotic. It's unmanageable. Tupac's driving off into the desert, and you get this footage at the end of the the shoot. And you have a structure because it's you know linked to a song. But what are you thinking? Are you thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? Are you what are you thinking? Again, I'm, I'm just being honest. The reality is, I don't want this to sound egotistical. I'm just trying to be honest. The reality is, I'm lucky I'm me. Because whatever I got is the minimum that would, anyone would be able to get. And luckily, because I loved it so much, I was able to get that. So if that's considered great, I'm lucky because I loved it enough to do everything I had to do to make it great, because it wasn't going to be great. 
Well, I think you made, I think you made your luck, your own luck. So um, I'd like to, for us to look at another video, um, just to make you squirm a little bit more. Um, could we look at, uh, take a look at Mace Feel So Good? Okay, so there, there are shiny suit moments, <laughs> and there are shiny suit moments. So is this the consummate shiny suit moment? Um, well, it is Vegas. So that was the idea. I'm going to make everything shiny. That's what it is. And that video is styled by June Ambrose. So um, again, I'm lucky to have someone so blessed to have done that with me. What, um, you know, this, this, this is from Mace's Harlem World album. Obviously, Harlem World is what he represents. Um, and, you know, by the same token, there is, how would you sort of describe what that sensibility is? Because even though this is shot in Las Vegas, you know, to me, it carries that spirit as well. Would, would you say that's the case or is, am I totally off base here? Um, you're totally off base. <laughs> uh, I, I mean that in a good way. <laughs> Uh, these, all of these things are really just visual interpretations of the music. Yes. That's my job. So that was really just how I felt about the song. Puff sends it, I listen to it, and it's big, like Vegas to me. Like, I feel like, you see, you see the things, I'm, I'm, I'm putting feelings into it because that's what that is. So that's the reasoning for it. It was no... There's no design to it. Mm -hmm. It was uh, all emotion at that time. But that's, luckily, yeah. luckily, these guys all fought, went with my, my emotions. <laughs> you know, that's the only way I could describe it. Like, I, I led everybody in these directions, and they all went. Now, when, when you get a piece of music, and you listen to it, and you're treating the music... What do you think in terms of that process, in terms of prioritizing what your emotions are? Is it the first emotion that you found to be the truest emotion? Or is it something that you actually take some time to work through? Well, at the time, again, this is when I was younger, uh, I was just pure artist, so... I only I went with the first thing every time. Every one of these things is is probably uh, the first thing that I, that came to my mind, with the exception of California Love, which that's probably the only treatment that I didn't write in my uh, career. Um, but yeah, it was the first the first thing comes to mind. Would you say when you say for this this era this moment, but is it, is it not the same for you with right now in terms of your process of, of going through it? Well, I don't, I'm not the same person, so I, do, I think differently than I did then. So then it was, again, it was, uh, there was no, how to describe it to you? There's no internet, really. <laughs> so I was isolated in a way that you guys aren't. You know what I'm saying? Like that, there was no, there was, that, that wasn't there, so... It, it came about differently. There's no iPhone. I, 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 does that make sense to you? Like, the, imagine the world with no iPhone. Right. That's what it was. <laughs> and uh, we were out there winging it, you know, like everybody was out there. Mm -hmm. you know, these aren't shot on digital. These are film cameras. There was no such thing as digital filmmaking. Yeah. So every, every shot was loaded into a magazine, rolls of film. There's warehouses of these things. And, and I, I stress this to, to a lot of these record labels, and I'm going off subject, but there's warehouses of, of all of this stuff that's reels and reels of stuff that no one's even seen that wasn't used. Yeah. H history. like, And I mean like years of it that uh, this, the, digital, the digital world doesn't reflect, that that reflects. 
You know, it's that. And somebody should, is going to have to go back and archive it probably one of these days. What is the turn? Like, what's the timetable? Like, the turnaround process? I guess just even like, because this is such a different experience for people perhaps now um, to relate to, you know, how many days is a shoot like this? You know, uh, you know how how long is 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 it from from conception to completion? This, you think? Yeah, something like this. Yeah, it's, I, I I have to explain it. It's not. It wasn't done that way. These were wars. So <laughs> small wars. So the percentage of time planning and doing production and pl and and doing physical pre-production like the normal is only a small percentage of what goes into that, where there's days of down arguing, like, let's have, like, you know, full-on wars about what we don't like is happening. Like, so it was like, a, these videos are like, all of those are ingredients to what you see, the end result. Like, when I said chaos with, with Dre in that video, that, that it couldn't have been good if it didn't ha have that ingredient, I think. And all of these were like that. It was just like, it was war. Was there a specific battle or war that you recall with this? Yeah. Okay, and what was that? Um, well, I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, It was a, it's like a part of what, what made all of Puff's videos great, I think. The, the fact that he included me and I had a mind of my own. So those, those collaborations are the greatest ever. And when we talk, it's the, the most uh, respect I think I get from anyone in the businesses. I get it from Puff. And, I mean, you still work together and have worked together. Um now so it's testament to the relationship that you have and we've also agreed not to do it anymore and to stay friends <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't it, you know when you said it was a war i'm i'm sort of like thinking of it just in terms of the process of actually just filmmaking as a process and just in terms of like you have an army of people and these this is your you know, you have your soldiers and your lieutenants and, you know, go up the ranks. Um, That's not the battle. You're thinking wrong. That's wrong thinking. The battles are mental, mentalities. You're dealing with, with egos inflated at the highest level when rap was changing the world. Hip-hop changed the world because of it. So... <laughs> So the kinds of conversations that were being discussed were, were insanity, insane. I, I, I mean, I, I watch movies like uh, Heart of Darkness. Anybody seen that? Right, so that's about the making of Apocalypse Now. And I can relate because we had our own moments like that throughout the culture when no one, no one got along. Are you going to play the, do, do they know what you're going to play? Oh, I was about to you gonna spoil mess something it? up. Sorry, <laughs> there, but there's one that's a that's a real exactly what I'm I'm talking about. And if he plays it, I, I can explain further. But anyway, most times the wars were uh, was mental because everyone you know wanted to resist what what we were doing, and until afterwards, uh, I don't know. I I don't know if you're gonna play Big Pimpin'. I don't know if that's on the list, but. That's one of those moments where none of those guys saw the the end result coming. They just saw it as like, you know, I fucking up all my money. <laughs> <laughs> like he's out here fucking up our money. Like, you know, we're out here in, in the middle of Trinidad. This is the conversations. Like this is what the fuck is going on, like those words. Right. So once once you get past that, because and that's when again I, I'm just being honest, I say I, the, I'm lucky to be me is because I had to endure all of my friends not believing in what I was really trying to give. I wanted to give so much, and and a lot of times it was a uh, it was like that. It was yeah. I had to just be Jesus and get whipped. <laughs>
But now, like when I when we talk about it, everyone it's 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 we're all happy, obviously, because we, we're a part of something and and we're blessed. And again, uh, I just have to take a moment to thank everyone here for recognizing the blessings. Well, uh, whether you realize it or not, you gave us a perfect transition into the next video, which is not, which is not Big Pimpin', but it is Nas Hate Me Now. Yeah. I mean, we're talking just what we see just now. Um, you know, multiple locations, bi-coastal, you know, obviously you've done hundreds of extras before, but the pyro, the white tigers, um, the, uh, the furs. Um, the bulletproof vest that all the crew had to wear so we don't get shot to death during fucking certain scenes in that video. Things like that, you know what I mean? Like it was, it's a different time. Well, um, how did... <laughs> What was right, see? <laughs> how do you get um, how do you get the two white tigers onto a set and 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 have everybody feel comfortable with that? With great difficulty. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I mean, I also feel like this is after some of the signature visual cues that, you know, you became famous for, um, you know, the fisheye lens, um, um, you know, the letterbox, just all of these different techniques, the low angle, you know, was this in some ways just a reaction to people biting off of all of those techniques as well, or was this purely inspired by the song itself? Um, I, I lost the question. Well, everybody Im imitating your style at a certain point, making videos, you know, this goes somewhere else beyond that other people could not do, even in this version. So I'm just wondering if this was a conscious attempt also to leave people in the dust, do you think, well, you cannot do this. You can bite, you know, the fisheye lens, you can do all of these other things, but you cannot do this. <sighs> Well, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I didn't think like that. Not, not, that. None of those ideas were a part of my process. Right. Whatever people were doing was people. It wasn't me. I never looked at anyone biting anything. I just looked at it as uh, compliments. Right. You know, like everyone kept saying that was happening. And I felt like that would be, that was the, the greatest compliment someone could give me that so anyone would care enough to imitate it. Yeah. So it was it was just the music. It was it was only what am I doing uh, with this music? It wasn't in anything past that. I mean that's that's such a great pure way though of approaching it. And I think that speaks to why these things, these videos are, you know, making everybody so happy, <laughs> you know, watching them now, even though they're unfortunately making you very uncomfortable. I haven't seen that in, uh, I can't even tell you how long, years and years. Yeah. So oh. thank you, actually, for letting me watch it. <laughs> um, when you, when, just sort of riffing off of this, you know, sort of being on, in your own, in your own mind space as far as what you were doing in comparison to the noise outside, when the, the sort of 97 circa, thing became uh, a subject for parody in terms of just like the shiny suits, you know, um, or whatever. Did, you know, did that, were you, were you sort of conscious of that and did that matter? Did you take it as more, you know, satire is, is, is a compliment as well? Well, I kind of looked at it like uh, I left an imprint you know, people associate me with the entire 90s. And that, to me, again, I just count blessings. I felt like, you know, wow, if this can make anybody happy in any way, 
I, I did I did a good thing. Uh, we're going to look at one more video from the 90s, and, um, but this video could have come out today or any time in the future. It's Missy Elliott, and the track is entitled, She's a Bitch. <laughs> now, you mentioned um, the director, Jean-Paul Godet. Is that, is that, I'm not from pronouncing it. Jean-Paul right. Goud. Jean-Paul Goud, excuse me. Um, now, can you explain a little bit about your just initial inspiration for how you wanted to um, treat this music of, of Missy Elliott? And I guess it would probably precede this to the first video you guys did together, The Rain. But, um, you know, just when you mentioned his name, um, you know, I just sort of thought maybe it might be a, a good thing to touch on. Um... Well, the young lady that I told you about, her name was Judy Troilo. She used to work for Island Records. And she, when she introduced me to Michelle Jean-Paul Goud and Jean-Baptiste Mondino, who's a very important person also, mm -hmm. um, I immediately was familiar with all of their stuff because I grew up on, on all that soul music I was telling you about. And then the soul music rolled itself into other forms of music, and Island was the home place of Grace Jones, the, the same record label. And uh, it's an interesting story about that too, actually. Island Records, uh, f first artist that they signed was Bob Marley. The second artist, I think, as a group that got signed was U2. And then came Grace Jones. So it just so happened that John Paul Good was the Hype Williams for Grace Jones at the time. And I was already familiar with the aesthetic. And uh, I, just, I, I just thought Missy had the same thing when, when I met her. I'm, again, I, I'm telling you guys all this old stuff, but I'll just say it because we're here. Um, Missy was a, she was a part of a group called Sister. And that group was uh, assigned to Electra Records and produced by Devante Swing. Do you guys know that name? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so basically, the first Jodeci video I shot was called Fiendin. Fiendin. And uh, Devante was like, man, listen, I got these kids, and I, I need my kids to be a part around you and around us so we can learn. And I let him do anything. So he, he said, it's, they could just do craft services. If you guys know what craft services is, it's just the food. So kids showed up, and the, the kids who did the craft services on the Jodeci Phenom video was Timbaland, <laughs> Genuine, <laughs> and Missy Elliott. So that's how I met her, <laughs> before anything. So. I don't even know what year that was. That may be like 93, you know, was, I don't even know. But anyway, um, when she surfaced past Sister as a solo artist, she was already catching so much heat. I, I just saw her differently. And that's all that is. It's just like me saying, wow, um, let's do this. And everyone else said, no, you're crazy, but let it happen anyway. Those brains I was telling you about. The big brain at a lecture was Sylvia Rome. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, I, you're crazy, but I'm going to let you do it. And that's how we did the ring. And led eventually to this with her second record, her second album. Um, was this just another case of you hear the music and this is what you think of, or was this a treatment um, uh, that was brought to you? Well, the rain video was 98. So we're past all of that now. Now we're into decadence in the music business, too much money, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> 
And this was a part of that thinking. Like, you know, she was such a powerful artist when her second album came that we were able to do this video. That's a gigantic hydraulic M coming out of water. I don't know if you like that. That most music videos wouldn't be able to do something like that nowadays. You know, like may have been a million dollars just for that. Right. I, I think right. back then. And when 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 this is all you know, climbing and peaking. Are you thinking this is it? This is the new normal? Like we're just going to keep doing this forever because the music industry will be giving us these kinds of budgets to do this? Or are you thinking? You know, let's do this while we can, because who knows how long it's going to last. Um, well, I was raging, and that's, that's how I felt. But someone was very smart. It was a, a, a record, well, another brain, I have to tell you. Like, we have, there's, there's, there's going to be a whole history of this music business thing, and they're going to talk about these brains. Jimmy Iovine is another one. He's one of the brains. And one brain out of many pulled my coattail and said, I, this is coming to an end. And this was at the height of it. His name was Lior Cohen. I don't know if you guys know that name. <laughs> he said, hi, trust me. This is all going to come to a crashing end. He didn't say how, and he didn't, maybe didn't even know how, but he was insightful enough to see we were going too far with everything. And he was right. Yeah, but thank goodness you went, you know, quote, unquote, too far, because, you know, we wouldn't have this. Well... I mean, this is a realization of just, you know, pure imagination. And the ability, like, like I had these great people who allowed it. You know, Sylvia allowed it. Uh, Leo allowed it. Jimmy allowed it so many times when, as business people, they probably normally wouldn't. But they supported the art form that we were creating. And that's what this is. This is, this is why, why it's, it's still around. You know, Puff, Puff alone, he knows that this is a, a part of a building block of everything that he has. Is, are, are artists, I mean, I know artists like Missy Elliott are unique and special, obviously. But in terms of just the, not only the, their creativity, but their willingness to, you know, go, you know, go the full distance to actually physically put up with, you know, what is required to do something like this, which is super intense. Um, I feel no different than any movie star that has a big role to play in a big science fiction movie. What's asked of the star. At this point, we were proving that they were more than the music, that they were, they were bigger than rappers. That's what this was about. Now, looking back again, I learned all of this stuff. I learned that I, we didn't know what we were doing going forward, but now that we can look back at it, we really were, um, we were taking it past, past uh, where everyone thought it could go. And at one point, rap music was a joke. It's like everybody thought it was nothing. You know, you have to really, really, uh, understand that, you know, and, and all of these people, all these great artists, they proved they're wrong, proved everybody wrong. Who are the, who are the artists? Who's your favorite person to work with? My favorite person to work with artistically, in case anybody cared, is Beyonce, and I'll explain to you why. Um, the reason I say Beyonce, I, obviously because of who she is, but more so, uh, she just works harder than me. Like, you know, like I, at the time, I, I didn't understand that. Like, I never met an artist that would run circles around me in terms of her work ethic. You know, I'm used to dealing with guys who I have to force to do stuff. And she, she was the opposite. She was a young just, you know, driven is not even the, the, the word. So she, she's my favorite because of uh, she inspires me that way. Let's take a look at uh, Beyonce, Drunk and ah. Love. Why don't we do that? <laughs> so... 
So um, just for future reference, how how difficult is it to coordinate like a night beach shoot with like the two foremost most famous people in the world who are also intensely private? Well, I'm gonna tell you guys a fun fact. Fun fact. From start to finish, first shot to call and rap, we shot this entire video in three hours. So it's, a, a, again, a testament to the kind of artist she is and the reason why I, I was going into that with, and had no idea that he was about to play that, actually. But uh, she, just ha she just has a tremendous work ethic. When you, um, you know, when you have this opportunity, and it's not an opportunity that falls in your lap because you obviously have a relationship that extends back years with, with these guys. Um, you know, how, how are you able to capture something that feels very intimate um, and very honest? Like, you know, you have an existing relationship with these guys, but I'm just wondering for somebody who is trying to gain trust with a performer, um, make a comfortable situation, what is the key to that? You can't get it. I, I, I'm telling you, whatever happens with me, and I studied this and I really tried to figure it out, with these people, all these great people, um, it's, not, it's not my ability or my talent or any of those things that, that I would love to say that I have. It's, it's somehow they give me more than they give everybody else. Somehow that's, the, um, that's just some blessing that I got where if I'm working with a great artist, somehow they give me more than they would normally give to uh, someone who's shooting something. And that's what this all is. It's like, I believe um, that's just the blessing I was given that, that, that I'm able to get more out of the greatest. It doesn't matter who it is. Like my whole life, it's been like that. So in terms of what I've been doing anyway. So that's, uh, that's the secret. Well, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, you're, you're, you're highly self-critical um, and humble about these things. I'm just speaking my truth. That's what everybody's saying on the internet. I'm just telling you how, how it is. That's what they call it now, my truth. But I studied it, and, and that's, that's what I believe it to be. Well, isn't it also that they see you giving out and putting your heart into it? I mean, you'd have to ask them. I don't know. But again, it, it happens all the time. Like, if I got Tupac, I got, I get him, I got, I get that. He's shot tons of videos that aren't these levels of performances. It's a performance thing. Yeah. And I just, I, I guess it's the way we interact. It's not relationship. It's something else. Like, I, 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 uh, I, I've always had it with any, any artist, anybody who's in front of the camera. It doesn't matter if it's a model or whoever. It's just something that, that they, they do. We're going to open this up uh, to a couple of questions from the audience in just a Please, moment. Please, somebody help me. I need help. In just, in just a moment. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, we're, you know, we're in an era where artists, I mean, everybody has so much direct control over their own image and what they want to show the world. Does that make a collaboration easier or more difficult for you? Um, well, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're, 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 both, we're doing something great. It doesn't matter how you get there and care how hard it is or easy it is. That's how I look at things, by the way. Just as long as, as, as long as we're doing it and we both can sit back and be proud of it, I think it's okay. And um, how do you feel about uh, 
just the art form of the music video, do you feel that it's something that can return? I mean, do you feel good about it now? Do you feel like it's something that needs to return to a more serious level of craft? Um, is there something that's aesthetically pleasing to you about, you know, things being very do-it-yourself? Um, how do you feel about that at this point? Well, how I feel about it um, is in direct relation to the the digital camera, digital filmmaking. It's it's allowed for anyone to be able to pick up a camera and immediately shoot something great, color it how they would like, edit it, and put it into the world. No, this is a this is this is a time period of that, and it didn't exist when we were younger. We didn't have a, an outlet. So I think the the time that we're in, the digital filmmaking age, is a uh, is that great moment when anyone who has any ability can share it. Doesn't matter what level you're at, and it, and it's all it's all there to be seen by the world. It's like everybody gets to hang their, their paintings in the World Museum kind of thing. And it's just, that's the greatness, I think, of where we're headed. So I just see just opportunity. And as someone who's, who's taken, I mean, taken individual artists and placed them, you know, in environments that none of us would have imagined, just by virtue of using your imagination, their imagination, um, what do you what do you look to next? Like, where is where are the things? Where are the next pieces of inspiration? Seeing as you have this, you've done so much already. Well, it has to go further. There's always a a, a new place to take it. And it's a challenge for, for, for all of us, really. But I, I also challenge myself with that because now we're in a digital filmmaking age when things that took us weeks to, to prepare for, now you can, you can shoot instantly. So I think that's really where you're going to see if, if I have ability or if I don't in the next things that, that we're able to do. So it's, it's, it's a big reason why I haven't done another film right away. You know, this year is going to be the 20th anniversary of, of Belly Movie. And uh, I just wanted to be able to, to give something more. So hopefully the next things that you'll see from me will be able to further the whole thing. Does that make sense? Um, let's let's take a couple of questions uh, from the audience. I do believe we have a microphone or two that is circulating the room. So um, if we can bring the house lights up a little bit. Hey, what's up? Peace. My name is Anthony Prince. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Anthony, speak uh, into the microphone, please. Hey, Thank what's you. up? My name is Anthony Prince, and I just want to know, like, who was your favorite DP, and how was the process, like, working with him? Hmm. Well, my I don't believe I've gotten the opportunity to work with my favorite DP yet. Well, who is he? Um, or, or she, sorry. <laughs> or she. <laughs> it's, it's not a she. Um, but it could be, but it's not a she. Um, and I, I just feel that... Uh, I probably I don't want to say I don't know that's a weird thing, but it's someone who uh, his nickname is Chivo. And we, we know him for a long time, and he's been around for a long time. I don't know if anybody knows who that is, but um, we're just friends, and you know, hopefully one day we'll get to do a movie together. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> cool. Thanks. We have another like question. To, yep. Yes. Is it okay? Is on. 
Yeah, I, I would like to thank um, uh, Hype Williams and Red Bull for this presentation. <laughs> You, you previously built on the Fesh Island Lens and, and your repertoire. Is there anything you actually patented to protect your style? Um, no, uh, because I, I, I believe in giving. So I'm, I'm, I'm like the giving tree. So it's, all, it's, all, it, it's, it's for everybody. Whatever I'm able to accomplish, it's yours. Hey, how you doing, Hype? Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is David McDuffie. Right here. Oh, got yep. you. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so Belly is one of my favorite movies. Seeing the lighting in that opening scene is like one of the most phenomenal shots ever. Um, Thank you. Thank you for saying yeah, all that. Yeah, all day. All day. It's 100, too. It's in the heart. <laughs> so when you were speaking about um, what you thought was whack about the old videos, lighting is the first thing that you kind of mentioned. Could you talk about um, like the importance of somebody like Christian Epps who might not get like that type of notoriety in the field. You know, he's usually director, uh, cameraman, but we forget about the person doing the lighting. So can you speak to that? And can you also talk about your philosophy on lighting and color? Because not only do you light, but there's a certain tint and color that you use for your work as well. Can you speak on that? Um, sure. What was your name again, sir? David McDuffie. David. Um, well... I'm very old. <laughs> and you threw a name out, Christian Epps. I don't know if you know how you know that name. I don't know if you, you, you studied it or if you work with him. But Christian Epps is one of the original um, people who taught me uh, how to think like this. And he's you know part of our filmmaking uh, history. <laughs> But he was also one of those guys I told you about that I used to ask a bunch of questions and, and drive crazy when I was younger. And through that, he then became a part of my crew and later on my gaffer for many years and, and really was uh, instrumental in helping me do a lot of the things that you see up there. So speaking to him personally, um, he's also one of the great teachers of the DP who shot the Belly movie, who was Malik Saeed. And uh, we just kind of all grew together as one group. I don't know if you, if you know any of this stuff. You, I don't, I don't want to be answering stuff that he probably already knows the answers to because I don't even know how he knows Kristen's name. But we, we all pretty much uh, gave each other, like film school. Does that make sense? Yeah. And um, the reason I... I speak about lighting is uh it was the first thing i learned as as a filmmaker because it it helped me to understand how i f i wanted to express myself like how things are lit like when you walk into a room whatever whatever is going on in the room the lighting speaks to me first and i use that kind of language speaks to me because it's just what it is like like out of everything that's what i see first so that's what I worked on f first. And the more I worked on it, the more I, I realized I could control everything um, about what I was doing with color and lighting, which is that's basically, if you, if you watch all of these older, how to, how, you know, do it yourself kind of film institution, like the, the kind of tapes that, that I used to watch where, where the greats would teach you, they teach you lighting first. It's photography if, it's a, if there's a camera involved. And then um, speaking to the color, I think it just comes natural if you're artistic. I think, so everybody has that. Like if you're, if you're an artist out there, if everybody's an artist, you feel a certain way about the colors you use. That's why you pick them, whether you're drawing or painting. It's the same same thing with, with lighting. Does any of that make sense that, that I just said? Yeah. Okay, I have can, to check. Can you, speak to, can you speak to the blue hue on black skin? Because I, I feel like there's... In, 
And this is, and this is something that other uh, filmmakers and cinematographers have kind of used. Moonlight would be a, a, a good example of that. Can you speak to what it is about the blue that, and also maybe like the sheen and shine that you, you, you incorporate to? Uh, the last part, what did you say? And it, along with that blue hue, a lot of times there's like a, a glisten or a shine that uh, accompanies the, the skin in right. particular. Um, well, again, that's just how I view um, black people. We have like this amazing skin in all shades and colors. So that's just kind of like uh, natural to me. Like when I watch other people who don't, who don't think like that or, or somehow wind up making black people look gray or some weird shit. I, I just, 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 that's just them too. Maybe they wanted to make them look bad. I don't know. But it's anything. Like it's, it's, uh, it's not, I, I want to say it's not just black skin. You know, I, I lean towards that because I, I see things that way. But it's anything. Like it's, uh, Whatever's in front of the camera, we objectify it. And we just use our art sensibilities. When I say our, I mean like the people like me that I know of to, uh, to paint the picture. That's all that is. So if we're using lighting on skin and, and it's a black woman in front of the camera and she has amazing skin, why wouldn't we want to um, use that and make it, make it look like what, what it feels like to us? It's all of that kind of stuff. It's, I promise you, it's, it's very, it's organic. It's not, uh, it's not thought out. You know, there's just, there, let's look at this and let's see if it works. And do I love it or I hate it? It's simple stuff. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yes. Thank you, bro. Shh. I just want to just interject real quick because um, David mentioned Belly and... You know, this being the 20-year anniversary of its release in November, what do you feel that the legacy of this film is? Because every piece of press that you go back to, obviously, documents all of the, the issues that you encountered. Does, has time given you a different perspective on that experience? Well, I think mostly... Um, what, I, what I get out of out of the movie is is how everyone else feels about it. I never thought, you know, because for me it was a disaster. So I never thought we'd still be talking about it right now. First of all, so the fact that as many young people, older everybody that's out there has seen it and continues to praise the film. Again, I have to view that as a, as a blessing somehow. I can't, I can't look at it any other way because it's just so many people were affected by it and continue to be affected by it. You know, Terrell Hicks, who played Keisha in the movie, uh, call, <laughs> she, she still, she's still affected by it. Like, there's more Keisha stuff on the internet right now than anything. So uh, it's just, a, again, it's just like a magic thing that happened. I, I can't even explain it. And it has to, if I had tried to explain it, it would be because I had all these great people. June Ambrose was our costume designer. Malik Saeed was the DP. Uh, I mean, it's endless. Like, the, you know, the crew people, everybody gave their all. So that's, that's uh, the ingredients to Belly. I think we have time for just a couple of more. Oh, I, or, um, hi, nice to meet you. Um, when I get to hear creative, successful people share their experiences, um, I often wonder kind of like what challenges they had. So one question that came to mind is, you know, there's writer's block or creative, I guess like a creative block. Did you ever experience that um, when you had artists reach out to you with their songs? Um, and if you did, um, how did you kind of break through that? I was just curious. I mean, you have a lot of videos, so maybe you never experience a creative block. <laughs> or, or any challenges you want to share um, that you've experienced. I don't think, uh, I can't recall those kind of challenges in relation to the music stuff. 
because it was always like uh, love. Let me explain. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't do the project. So if I didn't immediately feel somehow connected to the people or the the opportunity, if for a moment I, I, I had to think like that, like I'm stuck, it wasn't for me. And maybe that was a mistake, but like I have many times when I regret it, like the very first uh, Alicia Keys song, Falling, you know, they, they really like wanted me to, to be a part of it. And I loved that, but I, I didn't, I wasn't able to see it the way Chris Robinson saw it, which he did a great job with the first video. So traditionally, that, that was, that's basically how I dealt with anything like writer's block. If it didn't speak to me, I, I keep using speak to me because that's, that's how I feel. If it didn't speak back to me like you should do this, then I didn't do it. Well, I, I would go so far as to say your work is political in the respect that you've created opportunities where they were not before, and you've created imagery where it was not before, which is invaluable. And I can't thank you enough, and we cannot thank you enough for your work and for being here tonight. One more time, please. Say thanks to Mr. Hype Williams. Thank you.